Hello! In this video we'll talk about alimony and specifically focus on the alimony problems. This is problem number one. Lemon and Lime were married for many years. On January 1st of year one, they were divorced. A 12-year-old son, Limonero, has been since that date, since January 1st, um, year one, and will continue to be in the custody of Lemon. During year one, Lime had gross income of $50,000 and made timely payments under a divorce decree, which is going to be discussed below. So under the divorce decree, which was issued by the court on January 1st, year one, Lime is to pay $1,000 per month to Lemon for the support of Lemon and Limonero until Lemon's death or remarriage. So upon Lemon's death or remarriage, that amount will stop. The agreement states that $400 per month is support for Limonero. But Lemon uses $500 of the $1,000 per month to support Limonero each month. Now assume the following. Lemon and Lime are not members of the same household. The decree does not specify any specific tax consequences. And finally, the decree, which again came on January 1st, year 1, is issued before 2018. And since then, there have been no modifications on that decree. So we're worrying about the tax consequences with respect to um, lemon and lime. Now remember that whenever you have any tax consequences, any income tax consequences, there's five questions you should always address. What amount of gross income, if any, is the first question. So an inflow question. So we're looking for inflows. The second question is what amount of deductions or credits, if any, so you're looking for outflows. So in this problem, Lemon is getting some inflows, $1,000 per month, and Lime is paying that $1,000 per month. So we have to worry about questions one um, with respect to Lemon and question two with respect to Lime. The third question is, when do those respective parties have to report any relevant tax consequences on their actual tax return? The fourth question is, who has to report that, which in this in, in this case, okay, Lemon is receiving the inflow, Lime is receiving the, um, or has the outflow, there's also Limonero, so we have to worry about, okay, who has to include, or who, who gets the uh, potential deduction, or credit, or whatnot, um, that's the parties, the who is the fourth question, and the fifth question is, um, what is the character? So let's just summarize again those five, those five questions, because that's very important. Number one is, what amount of income? So what income? Number two is what amount of deduction or credit, which I'll just say a deduction for this one. What deduction? Three is when? When? Number four is who? And the fifth question I'm not going to write down because um, this is not going to address characterization issues. The fifth is character, which I'm just going to tell you if there's any character related to this, it's going to be ordinary. So fifth is uh, character is number five. But we're not going to be worrying about that. We're going to be worrying about the first four questions when it comes to this respective transaction, this, the tax consequences of this transaction. All right. So um, let's first worry about income. And the reason we're going to worry about income inclusion first when it comes to a potential alimony situation um, or I should say, whenever you have anything related to um, marriage slash divorce, you got to worry about some general things. And what I always do is, again, do your five questions, but focus on the income question first. Income question one should come first. And the reason is because the uh, potential deduction that may take place will flow from those that same, um, you'll see the same analysis. So it really does help to look at the income issue first. To look at the income issue first. So the potential income issue here deals with lemon. Lemon, because lemon has an inflow. Lemon has an inflow, and that's the only way you can have income. You can't have income by an outflow by a line. So we're focusing on lemon. Now when dealing with marriage and divorce, it's important to understand um, there's really three different possibilities of um, what actually can happen, the, the, the actual consequences, what's going on. And it's important to understand those three things because 
there is difference in tax consequence. So there's three different things. And the best way to describe it first is let's talk about two of those on a continuum. The first is what we call division of property, which is over here. Division of property is on the left side over here in this continuum. On the right side is what we call alimony, also known as support, alimony or support. And somewhere in the middle between these two is what we call property settlement because it has flavors of both. Property settlement is somewhere in the middle between division of property and alimony. So division of property, the idea here is, and for those of you that aren't familiar with um, marriage, um, divorce, separation, the idea is that a division of property occurs when each spouse has contributed property to the marital unit, and then when the marital unit dissolves, each spouse in substance takes his or her property back. So that's division of property. So you have, let's say, um, two spouses, they come together and get married, and they both bring property to the marriage. Maybe one has a house, one has furniture. The idea is that them bringing that together, division of property, after, if the marriage dissolves, then the court might say, okay, division of property, let's look at the marital, what property was brought in, and then simply it might be agreed that, okay, each spouse take that property that was before, after, that's division of property. The tax consequences on division of property, there are no tax consequences. There's no gain, no deduction. There's nothing you have to record here with respect to our five questions. There's no impact on the tax return. It goes as if um, you know the, the spouse originally had it before. All right, on the other side of the, of, the, um, of the picture, we have alimony. Alimony, which is also known as separate maintenance, support, um, or other legal descriptions they have out there. The idea here is that they're like support payments. Now, the court might rule that one of the spouses, which here, um, potentially, we might have alimony, but potentially, the court ruled that Lime is to pay Lemon $1,000 per month until Lemon's death or remarriage. The idea behind alimony is that there is some um, legal reason, some um, reason that uh, one of the spouses should have to support the other spouse and child. So Lee Monero here goes and lives with Lemon until um, or since the uh, the divorce was was um, uh, was ruled. Uh, so one spouse has some type of legal obligation to support the other spouse. Um, that's usually what we see as alimony. Now it's important to understand under the law that that death or remarriage situation is huge. So alimony under law will not stop, um, you know, through generally speaking, will not, will, I'm sorry, will stop on death or remarriage of that spouse. That is alimony. Versus property settlement, property settlement, it has flavors of both of these. It has a flavor of one spouse is going to um, basically, uh, I wouldn't say pay out, but um, one spouse gets certain property from the other spouse. Usually, from and the spouse, and usually that property comes during the marriage. Usually, it's a house or some type of property. It could be it could be in the form of cash, but usually it's a house or whatnot. Um, and one spouse gets it, and the reason is because the other spouse has again an obligation. And but the thing with property settlement is that under law, it usually does it will not stop on death or remarriage, it can continue out. So that's why it has flavors between division of property, which has no tax consequences, and alimony, which I'll mention the tax consequences in a moment. Now property settlement has tax consequences more similar to division of property, meaning that there will not be any um, immediate tax consequences on the receipt by the spouse that receives the property settlement versus um, alimony you'll see, there can be potential tax consequences. So alimony, there can be income inclusion or potential deduction by the payor. So a payee spouse, which is Lemon here, receives the actual inflow. The payor spouse is the party line here that pays it out. So it's important to understand that lingo, payee versus payor. So payee is the party receiving, which is Lemon. Payor is line. So payee is Lemon. Payor is line. And again, we haven't decided whether this is uh, meets the definition of alimony for tax purposes, but we're worrying about the potential issues. We're trying to figure out what this is. You have to figure it out. 
is this division of property? No, it's not division of property because nowhere are we told that, um, okay, well, this money was uh, you know, originally owned. It's actually the gross income each year and will be paid out. So it can't be division of property. So we eliminate that. So we eliminate that. However, it could be property settlement. Just because it's cash doesn't mean, okay, it's not property settlement. Usually property settlement does not take the form of cash, but it can be cash. It can be cash. Usually, again, it's more traditionally thought of as, okay, well, one spouse gets the house or one of the, one of the houses, that's property settlement. And the other spouse has the obligation to um, allow that to happen. So we're worried about property settlement and alimony. Now, under the tax law, um, it's important to understand that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, at the end of 2017, made a distinction in the tax treatment of alimony. And it said that if there is a um, divorce or separation instrument that is comes into effect after 2019, after 2019, or there's been a modification after um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where it says specifically that um, that it will that the um, that it's not it's supposed to follow the new rule basically that it's not considered alimony under the old rules. Then what you're going to see is that alimony has the same treatment as property settlement. There's no tax consequences to either party. Same treatment. However, if it's before 2018, if it's before 2018, which you're going to see this even going after 2019. I'm sorry, if it's before 2019, I should say. If the decree is before 2019, and again, there's no modifications that deal with this specific rule where it says it's not it's it's not to be considered tax, you know, taxable for alimony purposes, then it does meet the old criteria of alimony and it can potentially be included. So that's important to understand. That's why this is stated here. This decree is issued before 2018 which is well before 2019, and there's been no modifications. So we're applying the old rules. If we apply the new rules, the new rules say, the new rules say it's the same treatment as property settlement, meaning that there's no income recognition by the payee spouse, and there's no deduction allowed by the payor spouse. But under the old rules, there will be inclusion and there will be deduction if certain things are met. And that's where we have five items. The first is that in order for this to be considered alimony under the old rules, it has to be considered a cash payment. The second requirement is that it must be from a divorce or separation instrument. Divorce or separation instrument. Now, a divorce or separation instrument has been defined under the law to mean a decree of divorce or separation, I'm sorry, separate maintenance or a written instrument incident to such a degree, a written separation agreement, or a decree requiring a spouse to make payments for the support or maintenance of the other spouse. So here we have a divorce decree in which Lyme is to pay $1,000 per month to Lemon. So that is a decree in which the court is saying that one spouse has to make payment to the other spouse. So we do have a cash payment, but a uh, Lime is paying $1,000 per month. So we have that. We do have a divorce or separation instrument because there's a, a divorce decree um, by the court saying that Lime is to pay lemon. Okay, we're continuing on. Number three is that the, the, I'm sorry, the instrument does not specify the cash payments are not alimony. So we're told here, so let me write that down. Instrument does not say not alimony. So that's a double negative, right? Instrument does not say not alimony. Well, we're specifically told here that the decree does not specify any tax consequences. And we're not told anything specifically that the instrument does not say it's not alimony. So therefore, this is also met. Number three is also met. So if, a, if, a, if an instrument actually says this is not alimony, then it will be viewed as not alimony and it would not be under the old rules. It would not be ta um, income inclusion to the party receiving, which is lemon here, and it will not be a deduction to line. So that's important. The fourth item is that the payer and the payee are not members of the same household when the payments are made. So not members of same household for payment. 
I'll just put for payment. So not members of same household on payment. I'll just put brackets around that, on payment. So when the payment's actually paid and received, you can't be members of the same household. And here we're told that lemon and lime are not members of the same household, and we're told for the entire problem they're not members of the same household. This is interesting little um, you know tidbit here. Is this is because um, some taxpayers were getting you know um, wise, and they were going out and they were having fake uh, divorces. They would go out to uh, uh, to Las Vegas get a divorce. You know they get divorced under you know and, and nobody knew this. You know, the family didn't know they actually were divorced under the law. People just thought, okay, the neighbors, the family, you know, the kids didn't know. But they did it for tax purposes. Because um, historically, when you look at the payor spouse of alimony, historically, that spouse would be in a higher tax bracket. So the payor spouse would get a deduction at a higher tax rate, and then the payee spouse would include that amount with a, with a lower tax rate. So you'd have this tax arbitrage where the one spouse would get you know, a benefit at a higher rate and the other spouse would have to include another rate and you'd be able to, you know, um, bank off the remaining uh, amount. So that's the first four criteria. Let me just rehash when we have to do the fifth criteria. First is that it has to be a cash payment. $1,000 per month, which is cash. So it can't be property. You can't say, oh, they're going to pay out, um, you know, any, uh, oh, we're going to pay uh, with, with uh, property, with property. No, you can't do that. Now, there is some interesting stuff here about what if one spouse um, pays some other, another spouse's loans. That's a little bit more advanced topic, but it actually can still be viewed as a cash payment, just so you know. If one spouse pays it indirectly to a, um, you know another party on behalf of that spouse, like if you have some loans to pay. Must be a divorce or a separation instrument, which we have a divorce decree here. Um, so we have that decree saying stating to pay, right? Instrument does not say it's not alimony. We, we talked about that not members of the same household. The fifth requirement, and this is a big thing. So I'm going to put the fifth one up here. Sorry for uh, you know not having the room. <laughs> the fifth item is that there is no liability on the payer spouse to make payments for a period after death of the payee, which we saw that. Okay, So the payor stops payment on death. And you can even view this also as remarriage. The idea is that, again, alimony is meant to be support payments. And the idea is that you're paying for a spouse, you know, um, when you when you say, okay, well, you know, death to, uh, you know, uh, for richer, for poor, death do its part, uh, you know, all that stuff, you know, you, you say that when you, when you get married. The idea is that one, the spouses are going to take part of one another. If one of the spouse does, in fact, make more money, then you have to continue with that. And that's how our law has evolved through the common law system and whatnot, is that that spouse still has that obligation to take care of that other spouse. Now, if you remarry, then it becomes, okay, well, you're doing another contract, right? It's, this is a legal uh, contract. That's what marriage is, a contract that the spouse will take care of one another, you know, for sickness or for death, that type of thing, right? So if one, if one, if, if that contract becomes um, taken by another person marrying and another one steps in, well, that remarriage, that should take, take over. So if the payor stops payment on death, and I would also say on remarriage, then that makes sense of what alimony is. And that's what we have here. It says that, um, specifically that this uh, $1,000 per month is for the support of Lemon and Limonero until Lemon's death or remarriage. And we have that here, until Lemon's death or remarriage. So it will stop upon those events. So that's important to understand, all right? So th that's what's really needed for to have alimony. So we do have alimony here. We do have alimony, which means that the payee spouse, which is Lemon, right, the payee, is going to have to include a portion or all of this $1,000. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then the payor spouse is going to have to get a deduction, get a deduction. And this deduction is above above the line deduction. And again, this is because we're applying the old um, rules. So the payor is Lyme. So Lyme could get a potential deduction here, okay, of the potentially $1,000 a month or some other portion. Now, one thing to note is that child support, child support is not alimony. It is not alimony, and it is not included or not deducted. We never include or deduct. We don't include it by the payee, which is lemon here, and you can't deduct it by the line, which is the payor. And the idea there is that, well, if you 
were married still, and Lyme was paying for Limonero, the son, even when they were still married, would Lyme be able to take a deduction for that? No. There is no deduction allowed for that. There's no deduction out there for, you know, simply supporting your children. So you can't deduct or include it. Payee does not inclu um, include, payor does not deduct. So here we're told that the agreement states that $400 per month is support. So if, we're to if we basically follow whatever the agreement states. So here, $400 per month is support for Lee Monero. $400 per month is support for Lee Monero. All right? And that's what we follow. We follow the agreement. But it tells us that Lemon uses $500 a month. Well, that's irrelevant. If Lemon wants to use more money, $100 extra a month on Lee Monero, that's Lemon's decision. But the court states that $400 out of the 1000 is meant to be child support. We have to break up this payment. So the thousand dollars per month is broken. Four hundred is child support. CS. I abbreviate that CS. And again, that is not going to be included. That is not considered alimony. Child support is different from alimony. And again, child support is not going to be included. Doesn't matter whether it's the new or old law. Doesn't matter. So the remaining one thousand minus six. I'm sorry. One thousand minus four hundred is $600. So 600 is alimony. Of the $1,000, 400 is not going to be included. 600 is going to be included. And that's per month. So for the pay e-spouse lemon, the tax consequences are 600 times 12 months. That's per month. So make sure you do that. $7,200 for the year include. Then lime it's a $7,200 deduction. And this deduction is above the line, which is good. You're going to learn more about above and below the line deductions later on when you learn about deductions. Above the line deduction is much better than a below the line deduction. It's an above the line deduction, which means it's calculated um, to calculate adjusted gross income for AGI, for AGI, above the line deduction. So just to summarize what we did here, we started by looking at our five questions and we noticed that we had uh, a lot of questions here because um, when you're talking about what income, what deduction, you have lemon and line potentially that can deduct. The when and the who, the when is, okay, we're looking at this year. The who, we're looking at lemon and lime um, with respect to this transaction. The, the uh, Luminero doesn't have to worry here. It's lemon and lime are, are at issue, this, the, the uh, ex-spouses. So we went through and we, did, we talked about the distinction between division of property, property settlement, which usually have, um, they have no tax consequences when they're actually received and whatnot. Um, you'll learn more about maybe property settlement and how that works with non-recognition later on, but there's no tax consequences. Alimony, though, can have tax consequences immediately to both the payor and payee. Now, under the new rules with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, Alimony is treated the same as property settlement where there's no tax consequences. And that that's only if the uh, separation agreement occurs after 2018 or if it was before 2018, there was a modification that happened after 2018 where it specifically states that it's not meant to be considered treated like the normal alimony, the old alimony rules. But if that's not the case, then we apply the old rules. So there's still, there's still going to be um, alimony, um, you know, there's still uh, separation agreements out there that have been going on for years and they will continue to go on. And this is, so you have to know the old rules and the new rules. Under the, old, under the new rules, there's no tax consequences. There's no inclusion to the party receiving alimony, no deduction. But the old rules, you got to go through and make sure it's alimony because it will be included by the party receiving and it will be deducted by the party paying. So to have alimony, you have to have five things. Cash, it has to be a cash payment, which we do here, 1000 per month. Divorce or separation instrument, which if you have a divorce decree stating that one spouse is to pay another, boom, that meets that. Number three, instrument does not say it's not alimony. So we, we talked about that. It doesn't say specifically that it's not meant to be alimony, and it talks about no specific tax consequences. Number four, you can't be members of the same household at the time of payment. We um, specifically are told they're not members of the same household. And number five, the pay, which is up here, sorry about that. The payor stops payment on death, and I'd also say on remarriage. And it says that this payment continues on Lemon's death or remarriage. I'm sorry, it does not continue. It does not continue on Lemon's death or remarriage. It stops. 
So that's important to note there. So then we have alimony. So lemon has to include um, $600 because $400 is child support. $400 of that is child support. So $600 times 12 is $7,200. Lemon includes $7,200 for the year. Lime gets a corresponding deduction of $7,200 to deduct during that year, and it's above the line deduction. So I hope this helps you understand the basic rules when it comes to alimony.